Hey there. Welcome to the Total Connected Show, to the Total Bitcoin Podcast. My name is Kevin Davani. I've been waiting for this interview with uh, Richard Myers from Global Mesh Labs uh, for a long time now because he's, he's one of the most really brilliant minds when it comes to uh, global and mobile mesh networks. Um, he's um, uh, one of the, you know, uh, he's the decentralized, uh, decentralized applications engineer at Global Mesh Labs. And, uh, you know, and uh, Daniela Perdomo is the CEO of Mesh Networking. He's using um, Mesh Networking Technologies. So uh, the vision is also, you know, to uh, uh, drive the build out of an infrastructure free global scale decentralized mesh networks free of carriers and ISPs, meaning, you know, in plain English, free of uh, centralization, actually. So I really wanted to have, you know, uh, have Richard Myers take on this. I'm sure it's going to be exciting and and really educational and uh, enlightening. Uh, so please, uh, if you, if you uh, like it, please share it, uh, retweet it, post it, whatever, give it a positive review. Uh, and subscribe, follow me uh, everywhere on Twitter, YouTube, um, all kinds of uh, different um, uh, podcast platforms. And yeah, after talking, you know, to, with Zia from Iran and uh, uh, Randy Brito from Locho Mesh, uh, so it's you know the, the the picture is becoming more and more holistic now. Uh, the vision is becoming more crystal clear for me. Uh, what the path is, the Pandora's box been opened, cat is out of the back. It's just a matter of time and process and, and you know, and critical adoption rate. And of course, yeah, technological development. And, and until we, you know, we have the infrastructure to have a totally decentralized network in, on every level and every dimension you can think of, whether it be Bitcoin transactions, messaging, communication, what have you. So this is the future we're heading into uh, by order of magnitude. And yeah, can't wait for this interview. And without further ado, um, here's an interview with Richard Myers from Global Mesh Networks. Bye. Welcome to the Total Connector Show. Uh, to the total total Bitcoin podcast. Uh, my name is Kevin Devani. My very special guest is Richard Myers. Richard, thank you so much for for taking your time and coming to the show. Merry Christmas again. Happy holidays, you too, Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> Richard, I've been following you for quite some time because uh, I find uh, the projects you're working on, um, Global Mesh Networks, is it called, right? Yes. yes um, maybe you could give a brief introduction on you know your background your path to bitcoin you know your what's your vision for bitcoin also uh, but um where do you see like the status of um of of you know the, this global or local mesh networks going uh, what you know where are we at uh, what is realistic what's the time frame is the roadmap uh, until we're going to have uh, especially in countries i'm originally from iran and um uh, what I, my vision is is that you know that we become more and more independent from the internet, especially in sanctioned or uh, hyperinflationary countries like Venezuela or Iran. Uh, this is my dream and vision. So there you go. You, it's your floor. Thank you so much for your time. Yeah. No, well, I mean, I can just give you a little quick uh, bit about my background. So I'm a software developer. I've been doing this for you know 25 years, um, but only in the last couple of years have I really um, left what I was doing sort of outside of Bitcoin and. It's so when I joined a company called Gotenna, uh, and they make mesh hardware. So they make they make the first commercial mesh device for consumers. Um, so whereas the military has had this idea of mesh radio or point-to-point -point radios. So rather than going through a through a base station, you know, your mobile base station, you actually can relay messages from hop to hop to hop. So this is what Gotenna does with their radios. And um, I, I began, you know, talking to them about how this could be used for, um, you know, in a cryptocurrency context. Uh, and that sort of one thing led to another. And I quit my job 16 years to go work for Gotenna to try to bring this technology to this space. And, to, and it's actually a two-way street because mesh networks have always been this technology that's sort of um, never quite been realized, even though the technology has sort of been possible for many years. Um, and I think that the vision of our founder is that, you know, one of the missing components is incentives. And um, that's where something like Bitcoin comes in, uh, the ability to incentivize people to basically provide communication infrastructure for their neighbors and, and at the same time use that communication infrastructure themselves. So you can be both a consumer and a provider of, of uh, connectivity. Um, so that's, that's the vision we have at Global Mesh Labs. And 
even though um, Gotenna is sponsoring this project and they're sort of the, um, the seed investor, if you will, in this idea, what we're building is all completely open source uh, and is meant to run on any hardware and any sort of uh, mesh network that, that you might devise. Uh, but of course, we're, you know, we're building it on Gotenna hardware. That's what we're most familiar with. But everything we do is open source and, and not tied in any way to a particular technology. Um, and, and I share your vision for, you know, especially repressed countries where uh, I just read in the news today that Russia is exploring how they can create a like Russian internet, you know, some basically that, you know, everybody's looking at China and the Great Firewall. And, you know, it's amazing we don't, you know, we don't sanction them just for that. Just, you know, the idea that, that you could have a, a closed down internet is really anathema to the whole idea of the internet. In fact, the way we have the internet now is, is actually a lot more centralized than the original internet. Um, you know, the original idea of an internet was this very robust, uh, hard to censor from that, con you know, initially the concept was in a military context. They didn't want to, they wanted to have a peer to peer network so you could route around blocking of the, of the communication. And I think mesh networks have the possibility at least to recreate that idea of a peer to peer internet that routes around censorship and routes around um, surveillance also. So that's another aspect. It's when you've got a centralized internet, I actually just wrote an article about this. The privacy trade-offs are quite a bit different for a, for a wired internet than from a, from a peer to peer radio internet. Um, you know, as it is now, when we connect to your ISP, that's tied to your identity. Your IP address is assigned by the service provider. Um, there are technologies that can help obscure that, things like Tor. Um, and in the context of like the Lightning Network, for example, that the Lightning Network is sort of, there's the original paper on the Lightning Network, which really was, you know, not talking about the privacy aspects. And then there's the implementation of the Lightning Network, which fortunately layered on sort of a custom Tor-ish, you know, onion routing system, the Sphinx based on the Sphinx onion routing. And that, that's how you can achieve privacy on a more or less centralized internet that we have, where your IP address isn't something you create yourself, but is assigned to you. Um, so it gives you this way to obscure who you are, it gives you sort of a, yeah, gives you this, this multiple kind of, uh, what do you say, sort of dead drops for information so that, so that people can't trace it back to a particular person. Um, but on the mesh, you've got sort of different trade-offs. You've got um, perhaps lower bandwidth um, with, you know, there's, there's trade-offs with how much range you can have for a particular amount of power. So we're, um, what we do with at Gotenna at least is, you know, and, and most technologies that are peer-to-peer -peer mesh radio technology has to make this trade-off because um, you're not going to be able to carry around a high-powered radio um, if it's a mobile radio. So you have to trade off distance and power um, and bandwidth. And um, one of the great things about Bitcoin is that it already makes these trade-offs for other reasons. You know, it, it's, it's meant to run on the lowest common denominator of hardware. Um, and that is mostly to save block space. You know, if you look at the way that um, Bitcoin operates, it's, you know, we're trying to minimize the amount of block space, but that also has a nice benefit in that much of the data structures we're passing around to make Bitcoin function also, you know, minimize bandwidth. So a, a, like a block header is 80 bytes. That's a very small amount of data. You don't need streaming, you know, you know, high speed internet to send around 80 bytes. So it, a lot of these technologies developed for Bitcoin are also well developed for uh, lower bandwidth peer to peer mesh networks. I mean, the peer to peer network we have for Bitcoin is really an overlay network on a rather centralized internet that goes through, you know, central ISPs. Um, but we'd like to map that now onto a true peer to peer radio mesh um, and um, use that not just as a way for Bitcoin communication, but as a way to just enable general communication. I mean, really our focus, you know, is, is not primarily on financial communication, but you can observe that financial communication is some of the highest value communication you might have. So it's, it's really a subset of general communication. Um, but our, our main goal for consumers would be essentially SMS messages over mesh, but the relays could be incentivized with micropayments. And, and, you know, if anybody's familiar, who's familiar with Bitcoin can see that if you're, you know, you're, you're sending a message from A to D, it's going to go through B and then it's going to hop to C and then it's going to hop to D. And this is very much how the Lightning Network is also configured, um, where, where those intermediate relay nodes, B and C, can receive some sort of an incentive payment. 
Um, and, and they're starting, they're already projects. Um, I can't remember his name. Juiced, I believe his name is Juiced, um, from the Ellen, L&D project is working on something called, um, well, let's see if I get it right, WhatsApp, I think it is, <laughs> instead of WhatsApp, WhatsApp. Is so, that the guy that Stephen Levera just had on, or is that yeah, another? I believe it must be, yeah, because he's... Okay, because it was too technical for me, it was really <laughs> high, high, I mean, I just couldn't follow up even with the te terminology, but yeah. it still except, but yeah, go on, sorry, but yeah. But he, what they're basically proposing is a system for sending like SMS style communication over the lightning network. Um, and we're doing, in, so that's, that's a good amount, you know, that's a good, um, so it has a lot of similarities, I would say, with what we're doing over mesh. Um, but because we're not going over the internet, we have different trade-offs with bandwidth and um, different ways to achieve privacy than you would using, you know, the standard lightning network as it is now. Um, but it's all getting to the sort of same idea in that relays are incentivized by the normal lightning payment, re, you know, relay fees to transfer information. I mean, the initial conception of the Lightning Network is that, is that these relays are being rewarded for their um, liquidity, essentially, for basically providing financial transfers, intermediate financial transfers. But you can as easily conceive of these payments being for the overall data being transferred as well, just like on a, on a blockchain. Uh, on the Bitcoin blockchain, the transaction fees are based on the number of bytes that are transferred. Um, you could also reward intermediate nodes on, on the Lightning Network in a similar way for just how much data they transfer. And in the case of a mesh network, that's important because every piece of data that you transmit from hop to hop is taking battery power, transmission time, um, you know, factors like that. So, so it really aligns, we want to align the incentives for being a relay with what it actually costs to relay to transfer from node to node. Um, so that's in a nut, you know, that's sort of now moving to what, what we're trying to do at Global Mesh Labs is to take a version of the Lightning Network. So the fundamental blockchain, really the same Lightning Network as we have now, but at the higher level application level, make some, make a version basically, which is adapted for a mesh network so that no intermediate nodes in this mesh network can get rewarded with lightning incentives for relaying data. And that's the protocol we call Lot49, which is essentially just this sort of fork of, of lightning to, to have the parts that are mostly different, sort of in a non-technical sense, is routing. So how do you figure out the route from point A to D? Um, how you do that in the current li lightning network is this idea of source routing. So every node knows where knows every other connection. And, and then they create a route, A, B, C, D, and they hide that in this onion system, um, which is then passed on with, with each hop. So one of the changes that we're, we're looking to make is to not use that system because that introduces a lot of bullshit that we really don't have the space for now. And to use something a little bit more like the internet where I just, uh, and, and yeah, something more like the internet where I just pass it to my router and then my router knows maybe a couple hops and it, so it sends it to its next hop. So each hop keeps an idea of its sort of local neighborhood and, and iteratively routes. So we call it, it's called gradient routing. Um, so that's, that's one of the changes we're making in Lot 49, which is different from the way Lightning works right now. But of course, these networks could be interoperable too because the fundamental payment system is, is not different. We're still writing the same sort of transactions on the, on the blockchain. Uh, the Bitcoin blockchain in order to make these payments. Um, you know, if, if like if a node drops out, it goes back to the blockchain for the payment to be good. That, that part we're not changing, we're just changing the higher levels to make it better adapted for the mesh topology, the mesh radio topology. Um, and that's what we call block 49. So those are the changes we're making to make that change. Um, yeah, so I mean, that's sort of a nutshell of what, what we're working on. Um, and, and the hope, of course, is Global Mesh Labs is what we name this project. We would like this to be something that incentivizes adoption of this mesh technology, whether it's Gotenna radios or, or other radios, LoRa radios, amateur radio, however you want to communicate. But it, it incentivizes people to run relays for other people so that this network can catch on and, and basically exist in places where um, centralized communication is either too expensive 
or uh, is censored or there's a disaster that's the other you know use if if this exists as sort of a central communication already if there's a disaster and central modes you know central communication goes out it's a you have this already in place for for people to communicate um, so that's yeah that's our that's our vision and and right now we're we're at the stage where we're starting to implement this so we've got um, a, a fork um, so I'm working with a guy um, we've got two other people working on this project with us. Um, Will Clark uh, is doing work where he's adapting C Lightning. So taking the existing C Lightning, which has this great plugin architecture and adapting it to um, do this other kind of routing. So to, to work over lower bandwidth network by taking out the current source routing and putting in this other kind of gradient routing um, in order to keep the bandwidth low. And um, I think probably in January or something, he's going to have something he can. We've sort of done some intermediate steps, and I think the next sort of phase of that should be something we can talk about uh, and show people look at the source and stuff on Jan in sometime coming in January, I would say. Um, mm. Oh, in January, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, this is still basically proof of concept right now, mm -hmm. but our, our goal is to build up some. So, start, we're, we're, we're sort of attacking it from two directions. One is taking the existing Lightning network with the existing Lightning transaction system and changing um, the transport layer. So changing, so instead of the internet going over the mesh, uh, and that's, that's sort of one direction, taking the existing lightning and, and moving it onto the mesh. The other direction we're taking, um, so there's another guy on our team, Jonathan um, um, Harvey Bushell, and he's basically looking at sort of the future lightning um, payments, which, so we're looking at something called L2. I don't know if you've, you've heard of L2. So L2 is going to require a soft fork change. Uh, we think that that particular soft fork would be really beneficial for what we want to do over mesh because it allows, allows us to do essentially what, they, what you would say is less uh, like non-interactive payments. That it's a little confusing because sometimes in the case of like WhatsApp, they talk about non-interactive in the sense that you don't need to use an invoice to, to send a payment. Um, but what, what, I, what I mean when I say non-interactive is I mean that from A, committing to pay B, that can be done with a single message, whereas the current Lightning system, it's one and a half round trips of communication, um, which doesn't seem like much. And on the internet, it's, it's trivial. It doesn't make a difference. But for us, every time you broadcast, there's a certain time and power required. So we believe using L2 and being able to do it. So when A, pays, when a commits to a payment with B, you can do that with a single message with L2. Um, which, which is just a, a bandwidth savings as well as a power savings. Um, so he's looking at it from the sort of next level of protocol, um, of, of Lightning protocol, and that sort of a, would be a modification of the L2 version of Lightning, which people are also talking about now for, as a, as a has other advantages for sort of standard Lightning. But for us, um, you know, we're, we're already looking ahead that that would help us. Um, make a more efficient network running over mesh. So these sort of, one is more in the future, you know, three or four years out, when L2 is perhaps soft forked into Bitcoin, you know, there's, we're moving that sort of towards, uh, you know, towards a, a functioning app. And then we're taking current lightning and also moving that towards an app. So uh, the ultimate result that we would like to show is, is somebody with an app and it has a wallet, lightning wallet, you can send a message and it goes from A, B, C, D, person gets the message and everybody in between got a few satoshis and they reply same thing goes back everybody got a few satoshis uh, and it's not you know the, the the economics of it may not be that you get rich doing it but if everybody if, if there's enough incentive involved then at the very least as long as you're transmitting as much as you're sending it should balance out you know you should be in a in a sort of payment neutral but if you happen to go somewhere like some critical juncture between two networks Maybe, maybe now you're actually earning money because you're providing this service of con connecting these two isolated networks. Um, and, and like Bitcoin, you know, once you create the incentives, you expect people's creativity to create the connections. Um, and one thing we, we're, we're looking at, for example, is um, it's an, the, the Blockstream satellite, for example, has this transmission service, and that lets you send a message with lightning payments to anyone and that would be an, a you know perfect kind of gateway for a system like what we're designing because the gateway to the internet could also send your message over the blockstream satellite and then down to another mesh network via somebody's receiver and, and 
now you've bridged some two networks that are halfway across the world. Um, so this is, you know, this is the kind of innovation we hope that having incentives will, will actually spur. So yeah, I, I wow, talked a lot there. Very <laughs> exciting, very exciting, Richard. So let, let, let's let's break this down like on a practical level. Uh, you know, I've been for, uh, I already told you that I had some really um, intense um, uh, interviews with Zia, an Iranian, mm -hmm. uh, you know, who's a Bitcoin enthusiast, and you know, I mean, as far as I could, he he described to me, you know, there's some things he. I, I guess he couldn't talk about very openly, but you know the whole situation with Iran, mm -hmm. they just shut down the internet like down to five percent or whatever, four percent, three percent. So, um, in terms of censorship um, resistance, or, or or the other way around, sensibility, sensibility. Um, I mean, how does this work? I mean, when you have a situation, okay, we got to differentiate between you know. I mean, we got the connectivity in general. We got connectivity for. You know, sending messages or whatever information videos uh, on the one hand, and then on the other hand, which interests me more is the Bitcoin transactions independently from you know from the centralized internet structure. Uh, what's the bigger picture? Yeah, uh, so you, you're basically talking about how could you do Bitcoin payments? How could you have a Bitcoin economy? I think w without the centralized internet, is that sort of what you're you're asking? Um, yeah, so. There's there's a bit of a, um, I mean that that is also what we're working on. But you you can never forget the fact that you at some point do need to communicate with the larger internet. It's not really um, you have to anchor on the on the global internet. So that's that's where services like, for instance, the Blockstream satellite that helps you anchor what you're doing on the you know if you receive a payment. You need some way to check that this is in the global ledger, that this is buried under so much work. And that's where services like the Blockstream satellite come in because they just broadcast this from space. You can have a hundred dollar receiving dish and, and be part of the be part of the, the global Bitcoin economy. The part where we actually probably come in is if you want to take a transaction, so so not confirm one, but actually pay somebody. Um, that's actually a fairly small bit of data. And by having a mesh network. Um, the idea would be you could hop from node to node to node until you got to somebody um, with the ability to um, get to the global internet. So it wouldn't go through the central ISP, but it might hop over a border, for example. So maybe you have your, you know, it hops a couple of couple of hops or cups three or four hops until it gets to somebody who's at a border region and they can hop over the border to an uncensored internet, or perhaps somebody with a shortwave radio. Um, if you've got a fixed shortwave radio, you can, you know, I don't know if you follow the NDK, did they send a basically Bitcoin payment across right. the United States. So, so we could have gateways that would be able to take these very, you know, relatively small Bitcoin transactions off the mesh network and get them onto an uncensored part of the internet. Mm -hmm. Can I ask you just what, what would be the delay? What's, what's the realistic delay? I mean, yeah, there would, like, be, there would be a lot more delay than you would have with the internet. Um, I mean, like I'm just thinking about the Gotenna radios, for example, they send, uh, what is it, something like 200 bytes five times a minute, and maybe a single transaction might take, um, you know, say it takes one, you can get it in one transmission, so that's a fifth of a second, say two, three or four hops. I mean, so you're on the order, you're on the order of a second each way, something like that. Um, so it's, it's real time, but it isn't like hours. Um, now, something like shortwave radio is even lower bandwidth. And I know that the tests that um, Elaine and, and um, Rodolfo did, you know, you're talking minutes to get things transferred across the United States. So, yeah, so there's definitely going to be a, a queue of, you know, whoever does that relay isn't going to be able to just transfer at the real time speeds. Um, and that's just one place where Lightning has a nice advantage is if I set up a transaction between two people, so you know A to B, then there's going to be a long delay for them to establish that channel because they're essentially putting money into the channel and then waiting to you know like getting it to the internet somehow, and then maybe watching a blockstream satellite to see that that's confirmed and buried under a certain amount of work. But once that channel is established, now you're um, you're not necessarily communicating with the outside internet. You can transfer value between you know back and forth over that channel without having to actually drop anything to the internet unless you lose communication or or 
or something like that. You, you might have to still occasionally observe the internet, uh, and that's a variable in the Lightning Network. So if, if you've got two parties, A and B, on either side of a channel, and they've, and they've um, committed value into that channel, and you've seen it on the internet, you know, you've seen it on the, the global blockchain confirmed, and maybe that took, you know, who knows, say it even took an hour. But now that that's done, um, you can transfer back, back and forth value, and, and you only need to, uh, and the variable is if somebody like closes that channel, unilaterally closes that channel, you just want to know that unilaterally closed that channel. Um, but that's just a read-only kind of operation. You just need some way, either have a watchtower set up or have a satellite, you know, access to a satellite broadcast, something like that. Uh, and now you're just watching for any sort of transaction like that. But you're not, you don't have to go through this process of setting up the channel and getting the block confirmed. You're just, you just need a way to monitor the blockchain because you're, you're essentially, if you're receiving a payment, you have to monitor the blockchain, even if it's a lightning transaction. But the timeouts can be really long. So if somebody um, tries to unilaterally close that channel, you can have your timeout be a week. So, um, you know, as long as you, within a week, see that they're trying to close that channel, you can take action. You can take action and, and, and put the more updated, you know, version of the transaction or try to um, penalize them if they try to put an outdated transaction on the internet. So, um, so, so the time, even though that, even though there may be a very long delay in kind of creating a channel, once a channel is created, you can do things rather quickly just on your local network. You can update between A and B really, really quickly, as long as you have a way to periodically get some ground truth to make sure they didn't close the channel on you. So I would say that's, the, that's really the, um, the way the timing would work out. How would you, how would you envision uh, this, um, to put in a simple word, layman terms, in my case, uh, to, to increase the efficiency, the signal strength, uh, the, you know, the tight-knit communication infrastructure. Is there, I mean, is there a roadmap for that? Is there, like, what's the progression level on yeah. this? Yeah, I mean, you, there are different kinds of projects. So what, what we're kind of focused on is the mobile, something that is basically paired with your mobile phone. So that's going to always be, um, you know, lower power than somebody maybe who who's got a fixed installation. So there's other kinds of projects. So what we would have would be a mobile mesh network. There's other people who are working on things that are more community-based internet. So that's where you have maybe a, a Wi-Fi dish that points between houses and creates a you know, high-speed internet. Um, so those two can work together. You can have a gateway between the mobile and the not mobile. The other way to do it is that your mobile can just have greater range. So there are ways to make um, the mobile device Italy, you know, using different, different spectrum, um, you know, using better antennas, things like that. You can also increase the range. I mean, already the Gotenna has quite a large range. I mean, it's, and, and this is, it, range is really the key function, more so than bandwidth, because the more range you have, then the fewer nodes you need within a certain geographic area to have a fully connected network. So, I mean, I think we would say something like four miles, I mean, roughly one6 six kilometers, something like that. It depends a lot on geography. If you're up on a hill or up in a building, you're gonna get more range than if you're down on the street in a crowded urban area. So there, there are many factors, but of course we're sort of trading off density for connectivity. If you're in a city, you're also theoretically, there are more people. So there are more hops that you could take to get around the building or to, to, to get you know, through some valley or something like that. So, um, you know, but, but the basic idea is that if you do have a high, amount of, a large amount of range, then that's a good way to bootstrap the system. So you don't, if it's something like Bluetooth has very little range, um, but you could see that it was effective in um, fire chat when they had the Hong Kong protests, I forget which one those were, but, but they, they had, fire chat was only Bluetooth, but of course when people are in a small area, that was a really good way to communicate privately. But it wouldn't necessarily work if people weren't gathered in one spot because Bluetooth is very short range. Wi-Fi is similar. It doesn't really go through walls at all. It doesn't go around corners at all. It, it's, it's quite limited. Um, so that's why we use something called the ISM band. And the ISM band has much larger range and you know, allows you to create a, this, create a connected network with fewer nodes. I mean, I think some simulations I saw um, you know, in an open area it'd be like, if you had five by five kilometers, maybe, tw I think it was, tw 25 nodes moving around randomly, you could have a fully connected network. 
Um, so that's the advantage that you get with range where it would be thousands of nodes if you were using Wi-Fi and even probably tens of thousands if you're using Bluetooth. So, so there's a really nonlinear relationship with range and connectivity. So we really focus on not the, you know, as much bandwidth as we can get, but range first, and, and that allows you to create um, connected networks, these bootstrap connected networks. But I, I do think if you get a central communications like SMS level, you know, sending your GPS location, sending an SMS message, you know, encrypted messages, um, once you get a, a central communication network started, then you can try to leverage up to higher bandwidth because now you've got people using the system. And now maybe the density of people you know, who rely on this is going to increase. And if the density increases, then the bandwidth can increase by using higher bandwidth, but shorter range communication. So, so I think it's the hard part is to bootstrap people using it. But once you get that critical mass of people, then you can start sort of filling in with higher bandwidth applications. Would that be a, Richard, would that be a difference? Because I'm, I'm th constantly, I'm in the back of my brain, I'm thinking, are we talking now about countries or, you know, um, with oppressive or repress repressive regimes or, or yeah. independently from that? Because I'm like, uh, you know, now that Iran is thinking or suggesting or the government is suggesting to whitelist people, you know, like whatever, who is close to government, who is loyal. I mean, it's, it's really weird, but, but, um, are we like uh, on which level we're we talking about? Like you mean like generally in any this this would this would work or what about um, in oppressive it, regimes? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I, I I'm not from an oppressive you know I've never lived in a place like that, so it's hard for me to know what the local how the local population could adapt this technology. Um, but my my sort of intuition would say that you probably would first get people adapt you know just adopting this technology amongst a close group of friends. I think that's how this stuff gets bootstrapped. And we have some examples of that. Um, um, we wrote a story in the, in the Mesh magazine is our sort of digital magazine for Goten. Um, we had a school in America, uh, not American, but an English speaking school. And they bought, I don't know, 20 or 30 of these for their teachers who lived in the nearby area uh, in Venezuela, in Caracas of the school. And they wanted a way when the power went out or when the, when the internet went out, to just be able to communicate with their teachers and, and the families nearby to let them know, like, should you come into school? Should you not come into school? Things like that. So really like a safety thing, you know, thinking of a, of a central communication for safety purposes. Um, and so that, you know, like that was the way you could bootstrap in a community like that. Now, you know, it's not gonna work everywhere because right now those like Argo Tennis, for example, might be out of the price range of the, the normal people. Um, but once you once you get a few of these sort of sort of groups who know each other who start to use it, um, then other groups could can leverage that by just sort of adding on. So probably the seed is going to come from some groups of people who know each other, and, and you know maybe it'll be the Bitcoin community. I mean that's part of my belief is that the Bitcoin community already has a good understanding of technology. You know maybe they're running mining equipment, maybe they're running businesses based on Bitcoin. And that gives them the technical knowledge and, and the financial reason to have some alternative communication network. Um, you know, may, you know, maybe that's how things get bootstrapped in one of you know some of these countries. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, merchants and miners, people who have a financial interest. But then once that kind of core gets going, then I could see people adding on to that for more general communication. Um, that that might be likely. And and like I said, because the protocols we're working on aren't tied to a particular technology, it's going to a little bit depend on the country. Um, like, for example, I saw some countries have, um, I don't forget what it's called now, but it's, it's like digital TV over the, over the internet, uh, sorry, over the satellite dishes. Mm -hmm. And you can, you can basically get some sort of digital content that way as well. Um, sort of like the block stream satellite. Um, and I, you know, I wonder if, you know, in countries where that exists, that might be a way for people, you know, maybe people get the block chain information that way just because they already have it in their home, you know, that kind of satellite dish. Uh, in other countries, maybe that doesn't exist, or maybe shortwave is better, you know, is more common in like India, for example, apparently people use shortwave radio. So maybe shortwave radio becomes a, you know, more of a backbone for this network. Um, so it's gonna, it's gonna vary a little. And, you know, from an oppressive regime standpoint, mobile mesh network is probably more likely to be what you want than maybe a fixed, antenna on your home that can be seen from the street. <laughs> I think, you know, that's, 
that's unfortunately, you know, safety is going to be a concern in those places. And exactly. Keeping yeah. things under covers, you know, things where you're not, you're not, not obviously got a radio imported from outside. I think that's going to be part of how people operate. Um, I mean, we've we've had people test these things in the context of how do you um, like hide it, for example. You know, you can take a, I should show you one here. Um, you can take a, you know, go ten. it's about this big. Mm -hmm. um, you could put it in a sock and put it up in a tree and it's got a battery that'll last for a day. So you can do things like that. If it's, if it's a small piece of self-contained technology, you can, you can do things like that or you can, um, yeah, I was there was one other thing. Oh yeah, you could have like have it on the on the roof of your house, but with a solar panel, so you don't have to get up there and touch it. And it's got a Bluetooth range that you communicate with, so maybe it's not tied to any one person, but it's accessible via Bluetooth. So creating these sort of indirections for your for your radio, I think, will be probably important in places like that. You know, yeah, I was going to ask. Yeah, I was. It. Yeah, I was going to ask you about the whether you know it could be could be possible with a solar cell or a solar panel yeah. like how, like you wouldn't need much energy right it's the like the energy yeah. consumption is is really super low right 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 now we have people doing that in fact there's a program in new york called the rise program r i s e mm -hmm. and this is a initiative by the new york you know city government where they wanted to create a more resilient communication network um the original um one of the original reasons that GoTenna was started with, was Hurricane Sandy in New York. Mm -hmm. um, and so the New York City also wants to create this sort of alternative network for disaster recovery. And so what they're, you know, one of the things they've done is they've got just a Ziploc bag, really high grade Ziploc bag. They put a solar panel in there and they put a mesh radio in there and they can put it up on a roof. And now you've got basically a, you know, and then the battery will last long enough from that solar charging to just continuously run, uh, and and you know, and it is relatively inex excuse me, it's relatively inexpensive. It's not like putting up a satellite dish or you know, um, you know, it's and, it, and you could move it, and you could put it somewhere else, you could put it up in a tree, you know, wherever you happen to be. So I think you know that's where people's ingenuity could come in. But the core technologies for doing that are relatively inexpensive. I mean, you go on Amazon, you buy a satellite, uh, you buy a solar panel, put it in this sort of waterproof bag with the mesh radio. USB connection. Now you're done. Um, so that that is something that I think people can do. And, and maybe if it's not a GoTenna, it's going to be something else. You know, you buy some other radio, do the same thing, but they can all interoperate as long as they're using the same kind of common incentive system. Then you can imagine hopping from one radio to the other via gateways that can talk to both. All right, got it, got gotcha. So um, for the sake of comprehension, as for, you know, just to break this down, it means that even a uh, you know. Um, like let's say repressive regime or government with or without its military could not interfere or scramble or in, in any shape or form, like, you know, disrupt this communication flow, yeah. right? I mean, a common question we get is like, could you jam their signal? Yeah. And of course the answer is sure. Yeah. You could jam the signal, but you would, you would, first of all, you would disrupt a lot of other communication. Exactly. The they would shoot into their own you foot. Would only jam it yeah, yeah. So your other, like your normal police radios, you know, if you put enough strength of signal out there to jam everything, you you would jam everything, including your own, you know, police and fire radios. Um, but the other reason, the other thing that's, you know, interesting about mesh radios is the whole point is that it routes around these problems. So unless you're jamming an entire city, and that's, you know, a lot of, a lot of uh, power and a lot of um, you know, it would be a, it'd be a very serious undertaking to jam an entire city uh, at sufficient power to really be usable. Um, and then, of course, like, are you going to jam, you know, maybe you jam in the 900 megahertz to get one kind of radio, and then you leave another kind of radio like Wi-Fi free. Um, or you're going to jam Wi-Fi, and now, like, none of your Wi-Fi is going to work. So, you know, that won't be popular either. Uh, and then if, if you don't jam it everywhere, if you just route around those places that are jammed. So... While it's technically possible, I think it's it's um, practically speaking would be difficult. Not impossible, but right. very exactly. difficult. Yeah, mm -hmm. as, you know, in a comprehensive, like to shut down comprehensively. And I think also one of the hopes from the context of a repressor, repressive regime is if if you know that even if it's only a small part of your population has this access to alternative communication then the value of shutting off the internet maybe isn't as important. It, is, it's, it takes away some of the value of jamming the internet. If you know 
you can't 100% shut down this information from getting broadcast throughout the sort of community, then maybe you don't try, hopefully. You know, hopefully you can, you can sort of head that off. So it doesn't mean that everybody has to be on mesh. As long as you have a sufficient critical mass of people that are outside of the ability to be blocked, then you hope that it just takes the value away from blocking it uh, generally. Um, so that, I mean, that's to be seen, but, but that would be one hope also is that it's like a, you can inoculate sort of just with a herd immunity. As long as enough people are on the mesh, then it takes away the value of, of blocking the easier thing that everybody can get access to, which is just the normal, whatever, internet, mm -hmm. mobile. So Richard, would you say the cat is out of the bag in this case too? <laughs> I mean, like in Bitcoin, yeah, I mean, like, just like a matter. Bitcoin. Yeah, like Bitcoin. Coin, you can't unthink an idea like you know you can't erase an idea i think once the idea is out there whether it's what we're doing or what somebody else is doing i think these technologies are gaining momentum um and that's um that's a, i think a hopeful sign because we're seeing the other side also gaining momentum we're seeing uh, a lot more brazen attempts to shut down centralized communication um, but fortunately there is a technology that can replace it so the harder they push on shutting down centralized communications you know i think the more receptive people will be to these alternatives and and you know maybe you just get it for your friends and family at first but you get enough of these people who are you know reacting in that way and now pretty soon before you know it there'll be an alternative that just is unstoppable so, right right you know, and <laughs> yeah you know and i and i changed my terminology because you know i i used to speak about mass adoption mass adoption but now again it's about the critical adoption rate and i don't know who said it like uh was it like uh uh, Corey Clipson from Give Bitcoin also he also talked about critical adoption rate and you need only maybe three to four percent of the of the population with it you know within a nation state country or actually globally. Mm -hmm. um, how much does it take to trigger you know this exponential chain reaction of of, of growth of of uh, systematic infrastructure growth and and um, would you say we are on that road already like on a trajectory? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we all the pieces are in place. I mean, you're, like I said, mesh technology has been around for a long time, but the ability to manufacture it at low cost and and, yeah. and make it some sort of a consumer. I mean, mobile phones is a key technology because now you can make your you already have your mobile phone. All you have to do is in and and to be honest, a mobile phone has everything you need to be a mesh node. It's right. just that the carriers and the and the people who make money off you now have no incentive to open up your phone to that. But that's also a direction. I mean, there are people building open source phones, for example. Exactly. And I can see those technologies evolving into mesh devices. So now you really have just one device. And like you might have two SIM cards, you have your SIM card and you have your mesh radio. And your mesh radio picks up when your SIM card is blocked or censored. Mm -hmm. So I think that could be a very easily seen evolution. And you know, so a lot of the contract manufacturing and open source, these technologies really support um, open source uh, and peer-to-peer and -peer communication. So yeah, I would say we're on a good trajectory, but you know, it is, it's like Bitcoin technology. I just heard this on a podcast I was listening to the other day. The technology for Bitcoin existed for maybe a decade before we saw Bitcoin. Um, so it, it, the, the thing to overcome is putting the pieces together and getting them into the right configuration and packaging and, you know, getting into and, and also happening, you know, think about when Bitcoin was launched, 2008, we had the financial uh, disasters going on and, you know, there's a lot of timing involved and there's a lot of just getting things, the, you know, just in the right sort of configuration for these things to get going. Um, and, you know, whether that's this year or next year, you know, I think it's going to happen. It's just hard to say when we hit that critical mass. Um, but mm -hmm. there's a tipping point. I think that's what we, you know, that's exactly. what we'll yeah. Yeah. get to that tipping point. And then I think it'll, it'll grow organically at that point. You know, once right. we get there. And maybe it isn't going to be the United States because we have 3G everywhere, or Sweden, for example, with even the mountains, they have 3G. But other mm -hmm. places where they're really under threat, those might be the places that really launch this technology because of the need, because they really need it um, and have no alternative. So, right. The needs, yeah. So, yeah, you're right. Um, so, you know, when the, once the necessities uh, are there, the needs are really urgent, mm -hmm. then I think it'll just take care of itself, right? Yeah, I think <laughs> Once so. it becomes critical, you know, because yeah. people, you know, once they need it, they feel the pain points, I think then they will also demand, really ask for it. 
yeah. and 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 be willing to be sort of the first adopters who who mm -hmm. want. I mean, the people. I guess. I mean, if you look at who uses Bitcoin initially, it might have just been technologists and people who really were more curious, intellectually mm -hmm. curious. But I believe it's spread a lot since then because it's reached communities that do have a need. And I think that's way we're we're now at the technology sort of phase for mesh, where it's mostly people who are technologically interested, people like me and you, <laughs> you know, at, at this point, who maybe are just find it very, you know, mm -hmm. find it very promising and very intellectually interesting. But once we create the right configuration of tools, I think then it'll be something that can be adapted by communities. And you know, like we're saying, we're starting to see that in places like Venezuela, who have a really dire situation, and they're willing to use this technology because they see the value for their day to day life. And um, you know, that'll just hopefully spread to more areas that can really use it. Mm -hmm. I'm right now on your uh, on the uh, website of, of you guys, globalmeshlabs.org. Mm -hmm. And it's pretty interesting. It says here, mesh-based peer-to-peer messaging network, 80 billion mobile messages are sent each day via carriers and ISPs. Mobile mesh networks offer an anti-fragile, decentralized alternative that can extend connectivity to places centralized networks cannot um what my question was is that because i noticed uh, let me get that out of this way <laughs> this question i've noticed it's a lot of pictures or i don't know news um, um uh some kind of reports uh, in connection with global mesh network and the military like uh, with, is the military like one of the primary clients of of or corporation partners of global mesh network or who are, who is approaching you guys <laughs> There's really no, yeah, I mean, so if you look at Gotenna, we have two products. We have a consumer mesh radio, which is what we yeah. started with, which, which we had a Kickstarter campaign that's evolved into what we have now. Um, but we also, it turns out that the sort of historical customer for mesh networks has been the military. Yeah. Um, but the radios they had were very expensive, very complicated to use. Um, and, and not something that every soldier could have. Or, and it's not just military, it's sort of paramilitary, things like firefighters and first responders, mm. um, wildfire, people like that. They, you know, that wasn't a technology. Maybe elite forces of the military could use it, but somebody like a forest fire uh, fireman couldn't because it was too expensive, too complicated. So um, we found, after creating a consumer radio, that there was actually demand in the, in the more... Um, first responder, you know, military sort of context. So we created this pro device, which is essentially the same as our consumer device, but can use other frequencies that are allowed by the military, but then aren't allowed to consumers, which is a shame, honestly. I mean, this is something that we could also talk about is why are there not more frequencies available to consumers? I mean, it is our frequency. We, you know, as, as citizens of this country, why can't we use any frequency we Exactly. Yeah. It's the same. Um, just uh, just a short injection. Uh, it's the same with GPS, right? Like, like uh, you know, G uh, it wasn't it like originally military, and then it, it took a long time till it you know found its path into the civil civilian yeah. usage. Yeah. I mean, if you think about it, GPS is still military. I mean, if they wanted to shut it off, they could. <laughs> they do. They have. You know, in military, you know, if there's a military activity, right. you'll find your GPS won't work anymore. I, I'm not as familiar with what sort of alternatives to GPS that might be out there, but, um, but, but if you really want to think about relying on your GPS in the case of a, of a real crisis, that, that actually may not work for you when you need it. Um, but, but back to like Global Mesh Labs. So you can think about Global Mesh Labs is really a spin out from Gotenna, even, you know, so we've got our consumer, we've got our, our more military or, you know, government sort of customer. But then Global Mesh Labs is really our open source initiative. So we don't make a radio. We don't, we, we don't, what we do is we make a protocol like, like TCP IP, like some sort of internet protocol. We're developing this protocol, which we believe would be a very high value to our consumer radios, but it isn't tied straight strictly to those radios. You know, what we're building is open source so that it could run on any technology that, that is basically using the same principles. Um, so I would say, um, yeah, there's really no connection. I mean, really the military doesn't need incentives. I mean, if you're a soldier or you're a firefighter or a policeman or a paramedic, you're going to use the radio because you're ordered to use the radio. Right. You don't have to, you don't have to have a incentive to do it. That's why really it's, a, it's more in the consumer context where, 
um, you know, if I have this radio and I can relay for other people, and, and the way it works now, people just maybe leave it on, you know, if they're an enthusiast, they might leave it on so other people can use their radio. Um, but you're not as motivated, perhaps, to do that as you would be if you, you know, why do you run your lightning node? Maybe you don't make a lot of money on it, but it's very motivating to see you're part of it and that you're getting these Satoshis and you know that <laughs> over time you're, you know, you're supporting this network. And that's the sort of ethos we hope to build, but in a communication context. So you're, you leave your radio running and you keep it on your, you know, tied, you know, tied on your backpack or in your backpack, something like that, or in your windowsill. You know, you do that because you see that, you know, people are relaying through you and you're earning some credits for doing that and you can spend those credits yourself when you want to communicate with somebody but um, you know that's that's what we hope that will motivate the bootstrapping of people doing this and and again maybe in the western world those incentives aren't sort of meaningful monetarily but they could be in other parts of the world you know where, where people's cost of living is a lot higher relative to their income what you earn for for being part of the communication infrastructure i mean what you're paying your state-run monopoly for mobile communication you could be paying your neighbor. That's exactly. Sort of yeah. And, yeah. And, and this is what I'm envisioning, Richard, because I see clusters of so many circular economies arising everywhere. And this is, I mean, this isn't that the vision eventually at the end of the day to have totally censorship resistant, decentralized networks. Yeah. You know? um, yeah. The circular economy is definitely a part of it. And, um, you know, Lightning Network is meant to enable these micropayment type of circular economies and we're just you know i see what we're doing is really an application on top of the lightning network we're building a communication application that people can pay for with their lightning credits um but it's but it goes to it's it's nice circular in another sense in that not only can you use the lightning network to pay for your communication but you can also use the lightning network to just enable the uh, you can use the mesh network to enable the Lightning Network in places that might need resilient censorship-resistant payments. Because that's one of the criticisms you sometimes hear of the Lightning Network. Well, what if the internet goes down? Mm -hmm. you know, what if they do shut off the internet? Then my shop that's sort of relying on these payments can't operate. Well, they can, though, if the mesh network exists. Right. Um, right. So, so there's, there's a two-way two street there as far as one reinforces the other. Um, and if one is, you know, if you've got this resilient mesh network, it also makes just general economy based on on these payments also um, valuable. I, I don't know if you're familiar with um, M-Pesa. So this yeah. is an African mobile payment mm -hmm. system that was really sort of bootstrapped by its own users. They found that they could sort of exchange mobile minutes and they started using that to purchase things. So um, I could see sort of what we're trying to do with Lot49 and Global Mesh Labs is being a, a Bitcoin based M-Pesa. So it isn't tied to a single carrier that you know, can start implementing KYC and all the other things that you tend to see or censoring people from making certain purchases. Now, we've got the same idea where the same token you're using to send an SMS from point A to B, you can also use to buy your cup of coffee in the morning. It's one oh. seamless payment system that both does the communication and does the payment. Um, so we can hope, wow. but that's, wow. that is our vision. That, that is the vision we hope will we'll gain traction over the next few years. So. I'm That's glad, great. I'm glad to yeah. hear, you know, with your knowledge of other parts of the world that are more, you know, since, you know, more, um, you know, suffering from totalitarian regimes. You yeah, know, that that is also, I think, a, a part of what we're trying to do. Um, but but really, people need to. There's an economic and a political yeah. aspect to this. Yeah, both of those are important. Yeah, and a monetary control. I mean, general, it's not only about you know this and that country. I'm like, uh, when you, when you just you know, when we zoom out, it's it's actually the the really underlying cause of of all the symptoms that we are you know we are constantly talking about, and not only within the Bitcoin community, but now you know with the uh, economical financial monetary crisis, uh, uh, the insanity it's going on, whatever it is, you know, fiat central banking controlled uh, negative rate interest policy, so whatever. Um, so yeah, so Richard, thank you so much. Uh, is there, are there any other uh, sources, information or, or um, websites in besides uh, globalmeshlabs.org uh, or Gotenna? Yeah, well you could, we've got, um, so at Global Mesh Labs on Twitter, um, you can go there. We usually post articles that we, that we write on this. Um, also, if you go to Global Mesh, Global Mesh, 
um, globalmeshlabs.com. You can also get to our GitHub. So we, we're, the projects we're working on in the open source that we're doing will be linked to there. Um, I think those are the best sources. And, and we also have a, um, from the Global Mesh Labs website, you can get to our Twitter feed. So if you just have, if your listeners have some question you didn't ask or that, that I didn't answer, they can get on there and they can ask. And I, I watch that um, when people post stuff and be happy to answer questions for people. And if somebody, you know, I would also say, keep your eyes open. We're, you know, we're working towards something you can install on your phone and test this out. Wow, really? That, that sounds really exciting. <laughs> we'll start soliciting for people to give it a try. So, so if you're really interested, keep your eye open for that. Oh, I'm sure there's a lot of people would be uh, really excited about this. Because uh, yeah. uh, for a lot of people, I think, you know, this is the solution, um, you know, to finally free themselves up and, and you know, not to have to rely or to be in fear, you know, of, of uh, being surveilled, controlled or whatever, or, or censored uh, in, in any shape or form. So really exciting stuff you guys going on, Richard. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, believe, I believe that too. So I, that's why I do what I do. <laughs> All right. So thanks so much for your time, Richard. And hope to you know, have you back on either one-on-one or even on a panel discussion, I can imagine, with other experts uh, and with really enlightening and educational. Great. Thanks. Nice talking and thanks for having me on. All right, Richard. Thanks so much. Bye. Hey, so what you guys think about this awesome, fascinating, really enlightening and educational interview talk with Richard Myers from Global Mesh Labs. Um, I'm really, really more than optimistic than ever. Uh, really fascinated, excited. Um, this is the way to go. And yeah, I see this, you know, wherever that is, whether it be, you know, uh, in countries or nation states, regimes where people are really, really uh, visibly and, 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 uh, and, you know, being hurt and, 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 and suffering uh, on, under embargo, sanctions, hyperinflation, repressive regimes, or what have you, censorship. Um, so it doesn't matter, you know, uh, whether it's in the Western world or so-called developed uh, countries, what have you. So I see this, you know, um, on a trajectory, I, I will, I see this really accelerate uh, exponentially, this process of development of, uh, you know, build out of the infrastructure of more and more decentralized, uh, you know, global mobile mesh networking. So this is the way to go. So hope you enjoyed this very much. Give it a like, share it, retweet it, post it, whatever you do, give it a positive review and any positive plan will really uh, help me, you know, distribute this content, uh, the message more to more and more people. Um, if you're, if you're a potential sponsor, an ethical sponsor in any shape or form connected with, uh, you know, with Bitcoin, with the Bitcoin wallets or, uh, uh, you know, uh, um, security, privacy, uh, what have you, services and products you, you deliver, please get in touch with me. I'm looking for, a, you know, for one or two ethical prime sponsors. All right. I don't want to have a bunch of sponsors, just one or two prime sponsors, because uh, this is will, was going to be built out with other cooperation partners in the very near future. Uh, this communication platform, the total connector in totality, but especially the total Bitcoin podcast. So give it a like, share it, retweet it. Uh, and, and thank you so much for supporting me for listening. And I hope, yeah, to, uh, uh, you know, talk to you soon, or, you know, you're going to hear me in the next, uh, next few days or, you know, in the next uh, new year, 2020, a very exciting year we're, uh, we're heading up to. And yeah, have a good dive into the new year, 2020. Thanks so much. Bye.